Society over um, a long period of years. I'm especially delighted uh, tonight to present this award because I've known both of them for a, quite, a, quite a long time, and uh, they're two of my favorite people in the Society, though I have lots of favorites in the Society. Uh, he has been a, um, a faithful volunteer in a variety of capacities. He's been a generous donor uh, to the Society's fund drives, a uh, longtime member of the program committee. Uh, he's also been on our nominating uh, committee, I think, uh, at least two times, and he's always been very willing to participate in any project, no matter um, what it is. And uh, he's always there. We, he's one of those people that we have on our, our list pinned up on the wall, and if we get into a real corner, we can always uh, call him, and he's usually available to come down and help us. Now, she has been uh, a trustee of the Society, as well as its vice president, and also its president. Keep you all guessing, you all know who it is. Uh, in the early 1980s, uh, she became involved here at the Society as a volunteer in the Oxford County Survey. And uh, she worked for a time with George Allen, and of course George left the project, and then she and I worked together uh, to complete the book, which was finally published in 1987, even though it has a 1984 copyright date, and it took us quite a while to publish it. Uh, by the mid-1980s, when I became uh, curator of collections, uh, she came on board as the Society's registrar, and for the last 12 years, she and I have struggled, uh, as Al mentioned before, not only to find a place uh, here in the building and also next door, door now in Stanley's Barn to keep all of the things, but we've also tried to keep a handle on who has donated what. We try to keep a number on everything that comes into the collection so that someday, uh, if everything works out right and we can move to the facility next door, we can finally get these things out uh, for society members and friends to see. And the two display cases we have here just give you a very tiny sample of what the society owns. I think it's now between 20 and 25,000 uh, artifacts and papers and things relating to Western Maine and Northern New Hampshire. So we are a great society, large membership. Unfortunately, she and I have done a very good job of keeping the collections a pretty good secret. Uh, so hopefully in the near future we'll be able to tell some of those secrets. Um, uh, so she has worked here. She's usually here every Tuesday, faithfully, uh, from fall through the winter into the spring. She probably has accumulated more volunteer hours here at the Society than anyone else. And I could go on and on, but I won't. So uh, with that said, on behalf of the Society, uh, I'm very, very pleased this year to present the Marjorie MacArthur Knoll Award to Dick and Jane Hoster. Poland Spring. So if you want to know about Poland Spring, he's the number one expert in the 
the world, I guess, now on Poland Spring. I don't know if anyone knows probably any more about Poland Spring than he does. Uh, he's a graduate of Bates College, and uh, he's now the assistant director at the Margaret Chase Smith Library. So without further ado, Dave Richards. Thank you. I'm very pleased uh, to have the invitation to speak to the Bethel Historical Society. Uh, I've been a long time admirer of the society. Uh, as Stan mentioned, uh, the first time uh, that I was here was in uh, 1985 for the Good Standard Buildings um, exhibit that was uh, here at the Historical Society. Uh, I was impressed at that time uh, by the beauty of the town and the vitality of this historical society. Uh, more recently, um, last summer, I was working at the Andrew Scoggin Historical Society down in Auburn. And as I looked up the Andrew Scoggin River, uh, figuratively, uh, I saw the Bethel Historical Society. And I remember very vividly uh, sitting at the desk at the Andrew Scoggin Historical Society reading your newsletter and seeing that you had 1,000 members and thinking, oh my word, how can we ever compete with that? And then I looked down the Androscoggin River to the Pachepska Historical Society uh, in Brunswick and read their newsletter and saw that there was uh, Joshua Chamberlain mania sweeping the country uh, to the benefit of the Pachepska Historical Society. I said, oh my word, how can I compete with that? And uh, fortunately, the Margaret Chase Smith Library was looking for uh, an assistant director at that time, and I said, I'm getting out of the Androscoggin Historical Society. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't compete with the Bethel Historical Society and its 1,000 members and the Pajepska Historical Society and the Joshua Chamberlain Mania. Uh, so in December of 1996, uh, I began working at the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And I want you to know that uh, because that means I never knew Margaret Chase Smith. She died. 1995. Uh, I'm the, the first post-Margaret Chase Smith employee at the Margaret Chase Smith Library. Now that has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one is it means uh, that I have a lot to learn about uh, the life and times of Margaret Chase Smith. But I also think it's an advantage uh, to some extent that I'm not uh, familiar with the legend and myth uh, perhaps that's grown up in Maine about Margaret Chase Smith. So, uh, what you're going to be hearing from me tonight are my own personal observations, uh, what I've learned uh, since December about Margaret Chase Smith. And as my director likes to point out, he's been there for over 10 years now, uh, we're not interested in producing a court history, an official history of Margaret Chase Smith. Uh, so, uh, as I say, what you'll be hearing tonight are my personal observations. Uh, I intend this to be very informal. Uh, you, many, many of you may have known Margaret Chase Smith much better than I ever will. So if you have comments to offer, please do. If you have questions to ask, uh, please do. Uh, the format uh, is going to be that uh, in a few moments I will begin to show you slides, about 25 slides. Uh, then at the end I will have um, some concluding remarks to try to tie it all together. 1997 is the centennial of Margaret Chase Smith's birth. She was born in December of 1897. And if she had lived for two more years, it would have been her 100th birthday this coming December. Um, in conjunction with that event, we have a whole series of centennial events uh, going on through the course of the year. And I have placed uh, a calendar up here at the front table, and uh, you can Feel free to take copies after I'm done speaking. I also have put up several brochures, one a biography of Margaret Chase Smith, uh, some of her noted remarks, including the Declaration of Conscience, probably her most uh, famous speech while she was in Congress, and then a brochure as well about the library. As I say, you should feel free to take any of these. Um, in the course of planning these centennial events, uh, we formed a centennial committee. At one of the first meetings, um, someone said that he didn't want these centennial events to just dwell on the past. He wanted something enduring uh, to come out of this. 
uh, something that would carry forward uh, the, the meaning of Margaret Chase Smith's life, the significance of Margaret Chase Smith's life into the future. And at this point, I want to ask you a question. And I want you to respond with a show of hands. I don't want anyone shouting out the answer, but I'm afraid there might be some ringers in the audience who will know the, quest the answer to this question. Uh, usually there aren't. Does anyone know who William Pierce Fry is? A couple people do. William Pierce Fry held the Senate seat that Margaret Chase Smith eventually held. He held it in 1897. The point being that a hundred years later, virtually no one in Maine remembers who William Pierce Fry is. And we don't want a hundred years from now in 2097 for people not to know who Margaret Chase Smith is. That's our challenge in putting together these centennial events. So uh, what we uh, have decided to do in terms of uh, the exhibit that we did this year at the uh, museum and library and in some of our programs is really try to emphasize the aspects of her career that we think going forward for the next hundred years uh, will be the themes and topics that will keep her memory alive. And they are uh, that she governed with conscience, that she served the public, that she encouraged the exploration of space, and fourth, that she opened doors for women. And as I go through the slides, I will uh, be emphasizing and highlighting those points, and then once the slides are done, I'll come back and give some concluding remarks, speak a little bit more about those four important themes, which we consider her legacy we would like to see carried forward uh, for the next hundred years. And at this point, we'll go to the slides. We'll have to see what we need to do with the light. Can everyone see that? Can everyone hear me? Okay. And as I say, if you have questions or comments, uh, feel free to offer them up. You may have to wave your arm vigorously because I can't see all of you. This is a picture of Margaret Chase Smith, or actually at the time, Margaret Chase, she hadn't married at this point, sitting in the lap of her father, George Chase, and standing is her mother, Carrie Murray Chase. As I say, Margaret Chase Smith was born in 1897. She was the first of six children of George and Carrie Chase. Uh, she was born in Skowhegan, raised in Skowhegan. Her father was a barber in Skowhegan, and uh, her mother uh, worked in some of the mills in Skowhegan, also worked uh, at a local hotel as well. There's a picture of young Margaret. Arrow was pointing to Margaret with her um, classmates at one of the schools in Skowhegan. What, what grade is that? I think it's probably a mixed grade that you see there, and I don't know what grade she would have been in uh, in this picture. <laughs> this is uh, the woman's state basketball champions in 1916. Margaret Chase Smith was their roving center. Basketball for women was played differently in 1916 than it is today. Basically what you had is you had uh, two women who stayed on the offensive end, two women who stayed on the defensive end, and then the roving center went back and forth between the offensive and defensive end. So what that means is Margaret Chase Smith is is the leader of the team, the roving center. She plays both office and defense. She controls the ball. And as I say, they were state champs in 1960. And she was all of five foot three. <laughs> Probably the tallest one on the team. Margaret's first job in Skowhegan uh, was working at a five and ten cent store, and this is when she was like 13 or 14, so very early she was interested in, in working. Um, later on, she, uh, when she graduated from high school, uh, she served for about a year as a school teacher. Uh, she worked as a telephone operator in Skowhegan. Uh, 
for eight or nine years, she worked for one of the local newspapers, an independent reporter. Uh, here you see her working uh, probably in an office of one of the textile mills in Skowhegan. And she also worked in the town clerk's office for a while. So she had quite an array of jobs uh, after graduating from high school uh, in Skowhegan. And was very much out there in the, the public world, the working world, as a young woman. In 1930, she married the man on the left. His name was Clyde Smith. Uh, at that time, she was uh, 33, and he was 20 years older than she was. Clyde was quite a prominent politician in Somerset County. Uh, in the course of his political career, he ran for over 40 offices and never lost an election. And he was he worked his way right up, you know, from figuratively dog catcher all the way to United States congressman from Maine. But he was more of a Maine boy. He wasn't really interested in going off to Washington and becoming a congressman. He wanted to become governor of Maine. Uh, but the Republican Party had already divvied up the offices and uh, had selected someone else to be governor. So he was. Um, assigned to run for Congress, and he succeeded, and he went off to Congress in 1936, brought along his uh, wife, Margaret Chase Smith, uh, who served as his secretary in Washington. Uh, he served uh, for four years, and then he had a heart attack and died in 1940. And uh, his wife ran in the special election to succeed him, and she won in early 1940, and then she had to run again in the general election later on in 1940. Uh, she won that as well. She served in Congress, uh, in the House of Representatives, for eight years from 1940 to 1948. And then she decided uh, to run for the United States Senate, which was quite an undertaking, because again, the main Republican Party, um, the establishment already had several candidates who were interested in running one sitting governor and one ex-governor. So she was really uh, up against it, even within her own party. Uh, nevertheless, even though there were four candidates, she received uh, a majority of the votes in the Republican Party. So amongst the rank and file Republican uh, Party voters, uh, she was the most popular. She began her Senate career in uh, 1948 and served there from, uh, until 1972. This is the house that uh, Clyde and Margaret lived in while they were in Skowhegan, a home that was on uh, Fairview Avenue. It was a 30-room mansion, and there were only the two of them, so they were really rattling around in the place. Now, one of the things they did to fill it up is they took in boarders. And of course, uh, what that meant essentially is that most of the work in terms of cooking and cleaning and housekeeping fell to Margaret, so she wasn't quite keen on that use of the mansion. Eventually, the, the house uh, was torn down, and it's currently the site of the Reddington Fairview Hospital in South Eden. This is a picture of uh, Margaret uh, getting sworn in uh, as a United States representative following the death of her husband, Clyde Smith. There's a picture of her in her office in Washington, and you can see the, the picture of Clyde next to her. Now, in terms of her congressional career, you're not going to find a lot of uh, legislation with her name attached to it. Uh, that wasn't an area that she excelled in. Uh, one of the few exceptions to that rule uh, is in 1947, uh, she was a firm believer that women who had been brought into the military during World War II, following the war, should have permanent status in the military. Uh, the military hierarchy wanted to keep them as temporary members of the military. They still needed their service, but they didn't want to give them permanent status. And Mark J. Smith would not stand for that. She said, either you need the women or you don't need them. And if you do need them, make them permanent members of the military. 
so that is something that she uh, pushed for. And this is a picture of President Truman signing a bill uh, making these nurse corps uh, in the various branches of the military permanent members of the military. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the passage of that bill. And uh, in October of 1997, there will be uh, dedicating a memorial to women in the military down in Washington, D.C. So this is um, really one of the, the major achievements of her congressional career. A lot of her work uh, was constituent service, uh, which isn't going to show up in history books, uh, and also committee work. Uh, this is a subcommittee she was on, um, uh, the House Investigating Committee. Uh, actually, this is the Senate. Uh, and she's serving on this committee with a person who became her nemesis, Joan McCarthy. At this time, they got along okay. This is, I think, in uh, 1949. Uh, in retrospect, what became the highlight of her career in terms of, again, what the history books will tell you, was on June 1st, 1950, when she got up in the Senate and gave what became known as a Declaration of Conscience speech, in which she criticized um, the methods of Joe McCarthy. Now, she never mentioned him by name, uh, but she was upset by the way uh, that he was going about trying to uh, deal with the threat of communism within the United States. Um, McCarthy had given a speech in Willing, West Virginia, where he claimed that he had the names of communist sympathizers who were serving in the State Department. And she kept pressing him to show her a list of names. Uh, and he kept changing the number of people that were on this list, uh, and he kept refusing to show her the list of names. And, and she felt that was wrong. Either he had the information or he did and uh, she just believed that this was in violation of our basic constitutional rights to making these uh, indiscriminate charges. Very early on in McCarthy's campaign, uh, she stood up against him virtually alone. Uh, there were only six other senators who would uh, back her up, most of them from New England. And uh, most people uh, either didn't think that uh, at this point in early 1950 that uh, McCarthy's attacks were too serious or uh, they were afraid that McCarthy would uh, turn against them and criticize them as being soft on communism. And as I say, in retrospect, uh, in terms of the official history that gets written, people really uh, dwell on that as being the highlight of her career. But what you have to realize is that she continued to be in the Senate. 22 years after that. Now, Margaret Chase Smith uh, was very concerned about the communist threat in the 1950s in the United States as well. But her approach uh, was entirely different. Uh, not just the communist threat in the United States, but throughout the world following World War II. Whereas Joe McCarthy went around saying that there were all these communists in the government or in Hollywood or in the army, um, Margaret Chase Smith's uh, perspective was that what we need to do is understand the conditions in the world uh, that give communism uh, a chance to flourish. So whereas uh, Joe McCarthy is going around accusing different people of being communists, Margaret Chase Smith takes a world trip visits Europe, visits Asia, to try to understand what the politics of these areas are, what the economics of these areas are, to try to understand uh, what America can do to try to prevent uh, the advance of communism into uh, Central, Western Europe, and into Asia. So she takes a very extensive trip in late 1954 and early 1955. Here you happen to see her uh, in Paris. And all she went to about 23 different uh, countries in Europe and Asia. She actually uh, broke the trip into two parts because she needed to come back to Washington uh, in late 1954 
because by that point, four years later, the Senate was finally ready to stand up to Joe McCarthy. Uh, he had gone too far. He had begun to say that there were communists within the army. And in the famous Army McCarthy hearings that are televised, um, he finally begins to be really exposed uh, for his, his unscrupulous tactics. So she needs to come home from this world trip uh, to take part in the Senate vote that votes to censure Joe McCarthy. And then she uh, leaves Washington and strikes back out, heads off to Asia. And this is a picture of her in India in 1955. To give you an idea of the stature of Margaret Chase Smith uh, in the 1950s, uh, this is a woman who has enough clout that she can persuade the President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, to come to uh, Skowhegan, Maine. Uh, he gave a speech at the fairgrounds, and then after that he returned to Margaret Chase Smith's house for a steak and lobster dinner, uh, which you can see taking place here out on the grounds of her home. And uh, what's uh, interesting to me in this picture is that it's a, uh, a bipartisan outing, but the Republicans have made the Democrats and must stand <laughs> downwind of the smoke. <laughs> Republicans are upwind, the Democrats are downwind. <laughs> that's Ed Muskie, that's Margaret Chase Smith, that's President <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a billboard for her re-election in 1960. Uh, her attitude towards campaigning uh, is something that's completely alien to me and uh, probably to most of us given the way that campaigns are run today. Uh, she refused to take campaign donations. She ran campaigns on two or three thousand dollars a campaign. Um, now, as I think about that and think of how wonderful it sounds, well, what that means is what people complain about. If we went back to that system, what it means is the incumbent gets elected every four, or two, four, or six years. Um, and in part, that probably is why uh, she was so successful in getting elected, because of a system where there was very little uh, campaigning that was done, very little media that was used, that tended to favor the incumbent. And uh, as you look through the files on the different elections, there'll be all these letters that have been written to people who have sent her money, in which she's returning the check with a uh, letter saying, I don't accept campaign donations. Again, that sounds wonderful to me in 1997, given all the horrendous things we hear going on about campaign uh, financing. Uh, but, as I say, uh, what this system did is favor incumbents like Margaret J. Smith. From the 1950s, um, as I say, she had a national reputation. Uh, people began to propose her name uh, as someone who might be a good vice presidential candidate for the Republican Party, or even to think that she might make a good presidential uh, candidate for the Republican Party. It wasn't until 1964 that she finally decided to take the step of uh, seeking the Republican nomination for president. Uh, she entered several of the Republican primaries in the 1964 election. Uh, she felt that uh, Barry Goldwater was too far to the right, Nelson Rockefeller was too far to the left, and she hoped that she could stake out the middle ground and uh, gain the Republican nomination. Uh, she really didn't do very well uh, in those primaries that she entered. She, in the first primary in New Hampshire, she came in fifth place. But again, she didn't do much uh, campaigning. And that might work in Maine, but that wasn't going to work at a national level. Uh, the best that she did was in Illinois, the Illinois Republican primary, where she actually came in second. And so this is a Time and Country uh, magazine in 1964 that did a, an article on her run for president. And this is her at the Republican National Convention in San Francisco, a little 
campaign rally that's going on for her. Her name was placed in nomination uh, at the convention, and that made her the first woman uh, in either of the two major parties ever to have her name placed in nomination for presidency. She didn't receive very many votes at the convention. I think it was about 14. And, uh, obviously, Barry Goldwater was the one Republican who received the nomination in 1964. This is her being uh, sworn in as senator in 1967, following her re-election in 1966. Uh, to the left is uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Mike Mansfield. She's being sworn in by the Vice President, Hubert Humphrey. And uh, behind her is the Republican Minority Leader, Everett Dirks. As I said, um, one of the things uh, that uh, we think will be one of her legacies um, is her advocacy of um, the space program. Uh, this is something that not many people are aware of, again, it's because it's something that she did behind the scenes uh, in her committee work. She was a member of the Senate Aeronautical and Space Committee. Uh, her interest in space first grows out of the Cold War, as you probably well remember. Uh, the Russians beat us into space. They put up Sputnik in 1957, and that caused all sorts of alarms in America uh, that uh, the Soviet Union had gotten to space before we did. And so her interest uh, in the space program, as I say, grows out of the Cold War, out of defense issues, that we even have a strong space program for defensive reasons. Over time, she began to see other reasons for having a strong American space program. Um, scientific reasons uh, that research and development and technology that spun off of the space program were very important to the American economy. And also for educational reasons. Uh, she saw that the space program was something that was really exciting uh, American students. It was something that was used to promote the study of math and science. So for the defensive reasons, the scientific reasons, uh, the educational reasons, she became a major supporter of NASA in the space program. And that uh, included this slide because it's uh, a picture of one of our first Martian probes. And you've all heard of Pathfinder and Sojourner, which is up there now taking all these pictures of Mars. And what you have to realize is to get to that point, there's a lot of work that went on beforehand. And here is Margaret J. Smith uh, in 1962 with the administrator of NASA, James Webb, with one of the first Martian probes. And again, through her work on the Senate Aeronautical and Space uh, Committee, uh, she helped to really promote and encourage the American Space Program. And um, this was a high point of that space program. Uh, President Kennedy put down the challenge in the early 1960s that the United States would put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Again, as you probably remember, in July of 1969, that happened. And this is a reception uh, for the Apollo 11 astronauts held in September following the return from the moon. At the left is Michael Collins, uh, then Senator Mike Mansfield, uh, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon in the middle. Next to him is Mark J. Smith, and the third member of the Apollo 11 crew, uh, Edwin Buzz Aldrin. This is a, a picture uh, in the cabinet room at the White House during the uh, Nixon administration. And uh, this is a policy meeting that's uh, being held. And you can see that Margaret Chase Smith is one, two, three, four seats down uh, to Nixon's right. One of the reasons for including this picture is to understand Margaret Chase Smith's career, you've got to understand what Washington was like for her. This is a, a typical scene. As you look through the hundreds and hundreds of photographs of her down in Washington, you see all sorts of scenes like this. One woman, Margaret J. Smith, and dozens of men. That's uh, the situation that um, she was uh, a part of down in Washington in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. She was really doing something pathbreaking, being one of the first major women politicians uh, 
in the United States. Uh, for most of her career in the Senate, she was the only woman with 90 plus men. Uh, the only other time there was a woman in the Senate was, uh, I think, from 1960 to 1966. There was a senator from Oregon, uh, Maureen Newberger, uh, who served in the Senate. But otherwise, she was it. She was the one woman in, uh, in uh, the United States Senate. I also include this picture because it was taken in 1972. And uh, next week, next uh, Wednesday, September 10th, uh, at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a talk uh, by uh, Christopher Bean, who is the director of the Edmund Muskie Archives down at Bates College. And uh, he used to work for the National Archives, and one of his responsibilities was to listen to uh, and transcribe the Nixon Watergate tapes. And he says that this picture that you see in this room in 1972 would have been taped. Uh, there was a tape uh, a microphone in the cabinet room uh, that recorded all uh, meetings between 1971 and 1973. Now, uh, Margaret Chase Smith lost the election in 1972. She ran against William Hathaway and was beaten, in large part um, because of concerns about her age amongst the main electorate, in part because uh, many people by that time disapproved of her support of the uh, Vietnam War, weren't happy with the sorts of responses she was giving uh, to her defensive um, prosecution of the, the Vietnam War. And uh, so in 1972, this uh, over 30 year long congressional career comes to an end. And at first, she was a bit uh, disappointed. She wanted to serve one more term. Uh, in part because people t told her that she shouldn't run, that she was too old. She was a very stubborn and determined person. If you told her she couldn't do something, that made her mind up immediately. And she would try to do it. But, very quickly thereafter, uh, she realized and accepted that she probably was too old. She was 75 in the 1972 election. She would have been 81 uh, when that term finished. But she wasn't just going to sit around and do nothing for the rest of her life. She wanted to continue to be active. And one of the thoughts that had occurred to her and some of her advisors is that given this long and distinguished career that she had, uh, something should be done to preserve her papers and to make them accessible to researchers and the public. And uh, so from 1972, uh, plans began to be made for a library. And this picture here is um, at the dedication of the Margaret Chase Smith Library, which was built onto her home in Scotland uh, and was opened in 1982. We just celebrated our 15th anniversary. She threw herself into work at the library. As I say, it was her home. She lived there, but she also worked there. What she envisioned the library being was not only a place that researchers would come to, but that main school children would come to, because what she saw uh, her mission being in later life was to teach main school children two things, have high aspirations, don't think just because they're from Maine, they can't do all these things. And she wanted to use her career as a role model for them. Here was this girl who grew up in Skowhegan, Maine, and went on to be this very prominent, famous political figure in the United States. And she wanted other Maine school children, like she had been once, uh, to be really moved by that example. And the second thing that she really wanted to instill in young people was the importance of public service. And she loved to have the school groups come and visit the library and uh, spend a great deal of time uh, with them. And uh, from everything I've heard, uh, she was very charismatic with them. Even though there was a tremendous age difference between them, they really were quite attentive uh, to the message she had to deliver. For her long and distinguished uh, public service, 1989, 
uh, President Bush presented her with uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor that a civilian in the United States can receive from the national government. And I always like to close uh, with this photo of her at her home in Skowhegan. This is a house that she had built in 1948 for herself uh, for two reasons. One, because it shows her at home. And even though she was down in Washington for over 30 years, Skowhegan was always home. And when her time was done in Washington, she comes home to Skowhegan. The second reason I like to use it is because the symbolism standing at a half-open door. Um, she did tremendous things in terms of promoting opportunities for women by her example. She opened many doors, but those doors are only open, even today, only, I think, halfway at best. So I like the symbolism of that. That concludes the slides, and if we can have the lights. I'll see. Uh, are there any questions based on what you saw on the slides? All right. Has anyone seen the September issue of Down East Magazine? Yeah. In it, um, on page 31, is a review of two recent biographies of Margaret J. Smith. Uh, and the author is quite critical. He actually doesn't review the books, I don't think. He reviews Margaret J. Smith. He's very critical of what he calls the legend of Margaret J. Smith. And as I say, the way I presented this talk is I'm talking about the legacy of Margaret J. Smith. And now I want to deal with this issue of the legend. Um, many admirers of Margaret J. Smith who have seen uh, the review in Down East become uh, very upset by it. And uh, I think that uh, the author was so intent upon debunking the legend of Margaret J. Smith, of which there is a legend, that he fails to understand and to address and consider the legacy of Margaret J. Smith. So again, I want to reiterate what I see as her legacy. Now one, uh, number one is again uh, this idea of governing with conscience. And most people focus on the Declaration of Consciousness, famous speech that she gives in June 1950. Uh, 20 years later, she gives what's called the Second Declaration of Conscience speech on June 1st, 1970. At that time, she's speaking out uh, against the extremes on the left and the right during the Vietnam era, war era. Uh, on the left, those opposing the war. On the right, those who she feels uh, are being too oppressive and putting down protests. But her ideas of conscience, governing with conscience, uh, exceed just two speeches that she gave in the course of a 30-year career. It was really embodied in her whole philosophy of, of government. And uh, to give you some examples of that, uh, a speech that she gave here in Bethel in 1952, uh, commencement address to Gould Academy. It's a four-page speech. In the first page, 13 times she uses the word integrity, 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 integrity. She's pounding this in the Google Academy students' head. Integrity, integrity, integrity is what you learned, hopefully, at Google Academy. Integrity, integrity, integrity is what you need to take out into the world. Integrity, integrity, integrity is what you need to bring to public service. Governing with conscience. Um, it was a philosophy. It just wasn't two speeches with her. Uh, this idea of governing with conscience um, also extends to her political record, her voting record. She was a very independent person because she voted her conscience. She didn't vote the way her party leaders told her to vote. She voted what she believed was the right thing to do for the nation, uh, not just what her par party leaders wanted. As I was doing some research for this talk, uh, I came across um, a, a tabulation of her voting record sometime during the 1950s. And it said that she voted with the Republican Party 51% of the time. That 
means 49% of the time she didn't. Now, to me, that's, that's the very definition of, of being an independent person. Just enough to still be a Republican. 51% of the time she voted with the Republicans. Uh, but you can see being very independent in that 49% of the time she voted against the party. And governing with conscience also extended into the way that she ran her campaigns. As I said, uh, refusing to take outside uh, political donations, financial donations. Uh, trying to stay above the fray and not engage in negative campaigning as well. But governing with conscience wasn't just two speeches, speeches which um, the author of the review um, derived as saying weren't very influential. And he's right. That her speech, her first declaration of conscience, didn't bring down uh, Joe McCarthy. continued on for four more years. Conscience with her was more than just a speech. It was her whole philosophy of how she conducted her political uh, second point of her uh, legacy, apart from her legend, public service. And again, public service is more than what she did in Washington from 1940 to 1973. Long before she went to Washington, she was a public servant. Uh, she was involved in many um, civic organizations in Skowhegan. Uh, the most important in terms of her own career being the BPW, the Business and Professional Women's Club in Skowhegan. Uh, she was the president of the local BPW. She had helped found it. Uh, she went on to become the, the president of the entire Maine organization of BPW. She was the editor of the Maine Society's uh, newsletter called The Pinecone. She was very actively involved in this civic or organization which served the public. And I might add, she was doing all this without any men behind her as another criticism that's made of Margaret Chase Smith is that she was just a puppet controlled by men, men like Clyde Smith, her husband, men like her executive assistant uh, while she was in Congress, uh, General William Lewis. There was no William Lewis, there was no Margaret, uh, there was no Clyde Smith when she was uh, being part of this business and professional women's club. She was quite capable of leading uh, a political career, a career of public service without uh, men pulling her strings. The bulk of her public service uh, is in Congress from 1940 to 1973. And again, it's in forms that aren't going to make their way into the history books. It's in the form of constituent service. Uh, the author of this uh, review uh, derides her for spending so much time making sure that grandma and grandpa got their social security checks. Well, that's a very important uh, aspect of the uh, congressperson's job is helping out their constituents. Uh, and it's something that she put a lot of uh, emphasis on amongst her staff. She had a policy that correspondence would be answered the same day that it came in. She took a, uh, put a high premium on making sure that her constituents got first class service. Um, towns like Bethel are probably very thankful that Margaret Chase Smith made sure that the EPA and uh, other um, parts of the executive branch provide funding for sewage treatment plants. I have a whole stack here of um, speeches uh, where she's noting that $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 has been sent to Bethel, Maine to help them with their uh, sewage treatment plants. Again, she put a lot of attention on constituent service, serving uh, the people of Maine. Uh, other ways that's reflected. Uh, as your servant, she felt that she should be in Washington doing her job. She shouldn't be going off on junkets. She shouldn't be running for other offices. But she took great pride and went to great lengths to make sure that she was at every roll call vote. For uh, many years, she held a record of 2,941 consecutive roll call votes. As I said, she went to great lengths oftentimes to make sure uh, that she could get uh, to Congress to cast her vote. It was finally broken uh, following um, hip surgery that she had. She was in the hospital. Um, they had made arrangements to put her on uh, a military uh, plane to get her to Washington, get her to Andrews Air Force Base, and get her to Congress in time to cast a vote uh, that was scheduled. Uh, because of some glitches with the flight and traffic in Washington, she didn't make it. It shows you the lengths that she was willing to go to to make sure that she did what she felt was her job for the citizens of Maine. Uh, 
And as I say, for many years, that was the record, 2,941 roll call votes. And another uh, reflection of that is uh, absenteeism. And she looked around the Senate and saw her colleagues, uh, every time a presidential election came around, abandoning their office and going off to run for president. She was appalled at their rates of absenteeism. And she was even going to go uh, to the extent of proposing a constitutional amendment that if uh, Congress people missed a certain percentage of roll call votes, uh, they would lose their seat. Now, nothing ever came of it, but again, it reflects her ideals of public service. If the voters elected you to be a senator or a congressman, you be senator or congressman. You don't go off and run for some other office. Public service, the second uh, important aspect of our legacy. The third, um, the space program, uh, which has really gone into a lull now, very active in the 50s and 60s uh, when she was uh, in her prime in Congress. And just to give you uh, an idea of what those involved in the space program thought of uh, Margaret J. Smith, uh, this is a quote from James Webb, who was the director of NASA during the Apollo program. He was the man who made sure we got to the moon uh, before the end of the decade, before uh, the end of the 1960s. And this is what he said um, after uh, Neil Armstrong and the Apollo 11 astronauts had gotten back from the moon. If it were not for a woman, Margaret Chase Smith, Margaret Chase Smith, we never would have placed a man on the moon. He realized as an insider how important all that committee work on the aeronautical and space uh, committee was, making sure that those funds were in the NASA budget uh, to, to pull off the Apollo program. He realized how important that work was. And then the fourth uh, legacy of her career um, is her role as a woman, as I say, opening doors for women. Now, this is not a role that she took on for herself, that she actively tried to promote. She wanted people to see her as a congressperson, not as a woman congressperson. So that's not the attitude that she went into this with, that she was um, going to be holding up banners and leaving the women's right movement. She believed women should have equal opportunities. Um, she didn't think that they should be favored at all. She was just asking that there be equal opportunities. Let me set the historical context for you. Because I think a lot of people forget what it was like for Margaret J. Smith. They look at her career as a woman politician on the basis of the way things are today, which is very different. When Margaret J. Smith was born in 1897, women in America did not have the universal right to vote. That's the context that she's coming out of. The 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment, will not be passed until 1920, by which time she's 23 years old. Let's skip ahead a couple more years to 1947, uh, while she's serving in the House of Representatives, thinking about running for United States Senator. What's the landscape like at that time? for her. She's in the House with six other women. So there's 428 men and seven women in the House of Representatives in 1947. There are zero United States Senators uh, who are female. There are zero cabinet members who are female. There are zero Supreme Court justices who are female. There has never been, in 19, up until 1947, a female woman, uh, a female Supreme Court justice. There are zero uh, governors who are female in 1947. That's the landscape when she decides in 1947, hey, I'm going to run for the United States Senate. And she wins. She becomes the first woman in America uh, to win a Senate seat on her own right. Now, she wasn't the first woman to be in the United States Senate. There have been several others. Most of them had been there essentially as gimmicks. Their husband had died, and they just filled out the term. They never stood for election and won the seat. They just filled out their husband's term. Uh, prior to Margaret Chase Smith in 1948, there had only been one woman uh, who ran for the seat in the Senate and won it, a woman named Hattie Carraway from Arkansas. But again, she was someone who was succeeding her husband. Um, her husband, uh, I believe, had died, and then she ran for his seat and won it. Margaret Chase Smith was the first woman to go into the Senate who didn't follow her husband. She, at that point in 1948, became the first woman 
uh, to serve in both uh, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. And in 1964, as I said, she becomes the first woman in either of the two major political parties, Republican and Democrat, to have her place, name placed in nomination uh, at one of the national conventions. So there are, there are all these firsts attached to her career. Um, there are all sorts of um, specific actions that she took that helped to uh, advance uh, and open doors for women uh, during the course of her career. <coughs> she was a strong supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, she first came out in support of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1945. Again, that's really her um, philosophy of the women's rights movement, that what women should be seeking was equal rights, not special rights. I mentioned how she was a great supporter of giving women uh, permanent military status uh, in the armed forces, which comes about in 1947. Now, again, in this uh, review, uh, the author derides her career, saying that it wasn't very influential. And I've also already mentioned reasons why it may not appear influential, because a lot of her work was done behind the scenes. She wasn't out there on the floor giving great speeches other than that one Declaration of Conscience speech. She didn't have her name attached to a lot of legislation. There was a lot of committee work, a lot of constituent work. Um, and yet, she was very highly regarded by people who knew what it really takes to run Congress. In 1952, uh, the American Political Science Association took a poll of its members to rank the members of Congress, best to worst. Margaret Chase Smith was uh, voted the sixth most effective Congress senator in the United States Senate, number six. Uh, so people who know how Congress runs in 1952, political science scientists uh, thought she was the sixth best uh, senator in the United States Senate. And finally, um, under this topic of opening doors for women. One of the things that has become most apparent to me as I've been there from December now to September, uh, a little less than a year, is what a tremendous influence she had on people's lives to this day. Uh, if you flip a little farther in Down East, if you don't just throw it down, those of you who love Mark Chase Smith and think that her name has been besmirched by this review, if you turn a little further, you'll find um, an article on the Whittier Schofield House down in Brunswick. It's owned by the Pachepskit Historical Society. And one of the last residents of that house, um, Isabel Whittier, uh, was one of the first, if not the first, female doctor in the state of Maine. Here's a woman during the 20th century who's uh, staking out new roles for women. And who was her great hero? Margaret Chase Smith. And if you look through this article and look at the picture on one of the uh, sideboards, there's a picture of Margaret Chase Smith. There's a whole shrine in the house to Margaret Chase Smith. This is someone that Isabel Whittier, this woman, this pathbreaking woman, became one of the first female doctors in Maine. This is someone she looks up to, Margaret Chase Smith. Uh, I brought some letters that people wrote to Senator Smith, thanking her for what they had done uh, in, in terms of inspiring her, serving as a role model. This is from a woman named Deborah Rosen, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy uh, from the University of New Orleans. Uh, she holds her degree from Stanford University in California written on August 26, 1984. I realize that it is way past time for thanking you for helping me to have the courage and conviction to make my way into professional life. When I was 17, which would have been in 1961, you spoke to some 96 of us girls nation delegates convening uh, from over 48 states to the nation's capital from girls state at our state capitals. I was aware even then that boys nation was taken more seriously had a larger lineup of notable speakers. But you addressed our impressionable group at one of our meetings, and from then on, I knew we could do anything we had the steadfastness to persist in. Here's a young girl in 1961, 17 years old, who's inspired by Margaret Chase Smith and goes on and gets her PhD from Stanford University. Letter, September 21st, 1993. 
When I was a senior at Caribou High School in 1971, I was one of two main students who participated in the Senate Youth Program sponsored by the William Randolph Hearst Foundation. It involved a week in Washington, including a day on Capitol Hill, visiting one's senators, as well as a scholarship to study American government. Most senators took only a few minutes from their schedule, but you were extremely generous in spending time with me that January afternoon. I remember our discussing the definition of full employment in your Declaration of Conscience, among other issues, and you thoughtfully followed up with a letter which I still have and treasure. Years later, when I realized how busy a senator is, your generosity in spending so much time with me became even more apparent. You have been and continue to be an important role model for me. As a young woman, I was very impressed with you, with all you had accomplished as a public official. You made me realize that with hard work and commitment, any goal was within reach. Anyone know who that is? Susan Collins. Very much influenced by Margaret Chase Smith. Very much a role model uh, for Susan Collins. Uh, October 4, 1993. Thank you for your kind letter and continuing inspiration. I recently heard a radio interview with you taped a few years ago that impressed me again with your positive views about life and politics. I have often mentioned how you were an example for me as I was growing up and how grateful I am still today for your leadership. With warm personal regards and respect, I am sincerely yours, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Mm -hmm. As a young girl in Illinois in the 1950s, who can she look up to as a role model? Mark J. Smith is just about one of the very few uh, female politicians in America. That was someone who really served as an inspiration and a role model to Hillary Rodham growing up in uh, Illinois. And the final one uh, that I'll leave you with uh, is a poem that was written by a young woman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who's probably about, at the time she wrote this, she was probably 13 or 14, she's probably about 14 or 15 now. And she won something called uh, the National History Day Competition. This is something that uh, junior high and high school students compete in. They do some sort of historical project on a local level, a regional level, a state level, on to the national level. Uh, she won all the way up to the national level. Uh, she was one of the national champions. What she did was a recreation of Margaret Chase Smith's Declaration of Conscience speech. This is a young girl today, 14 or 15 years old, who's very moved by Margaret uh, Chase Smith's Declaration of Conscience speech. And this is a poem uh, that she wrote on the way either to or back from one of her competitions. To the gentle lady from Maine, watch over me from heaven's blue sky. Find me in the sea of people swimming before your eyes. I love you, though I never met you. I miss you, though I never saw you. It is true, I admire you. Watch over me with your shining blue eyes. Watch over me while I try, try to follow you. Enzo Loero. I think uh, that her legacy as we go on to 2097, her most powerful legacy is going to be this role model. That even today, uh, that you can see in someone like Enzo Loero, um, is still very powerful to young women. Uh, that's going to be uh, I think her most enduring legacy, and hopefully that will ensure that her memory does continue on. So that in 2097, whoever has succeeded me many times over at the Margaret Chase Smith Library, uh, when they go out and talk about Margaret Chase Smith, uh, people will remember her, unlike William Peters Fry. Thank you. questions or comments uh, that you have and uh, as I say as you leave uh, feel free to take any of the materials that are laid out up front. Dave thank you so much uh, and if uh, how many have been to Skowhegan to the uh, Margaret Chase Smith Library? Just a few. Those of you who haven't it is a treasure and, and I urge you uh, take the time, go to Skowhegan. It is a marvelous facility, and uh, you will just be so much richer. And, uh, we all are richer for your work.
words tonight. Too. You're very welcome. Um, and I should point out that although we're called the Margaret Chase Smith Library, we're actually many things. We're a library. We're a museum. And her home is also there. And that is something that has recently been uh, opened up for public viewing as well. And I'm, uh, one of the other bits of research that I did um, prior to coming here was I had to get some sort of sense what sort of crowd I might be facing tonight, whether this was um, hostile territory or not. And I went through the election results in her senatorial campaigns. And in 1948, Bethel gave her 77% of the vote. I couldn't find it for 1954. In 1960, it was 73% of the vote. In 1966, it was 70% of the vote. In 1972, it was down to 49% of the vote. But for most of her, her time running for Senate, the town of Bethel gave her over 70% of the vote in the general election. So I could tell I was going to be among some friends. 